Thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Lindis. I'm an emergency coordinator with MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, or the English version, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, I'm go not going to show you any numbers or any graphs. I'm going to take you back. It will be a bit hard in this nice building, but take you back to where I came from some weeks ago. I spent two months in Monrovia, the capital of Liberia, uh, trying to, to fight these epidemics. So I'm going to try to show you uh, some pictures and to bring you to the field where this, we have all our patients uh, dying from this disease that we've been talking about on a daily basis. Ebola in Monrovia. I call it that I've been witnessing uh, a slow tsunami. Um, epidemics are slow onset uh, crisis, normally, as this one. However, this epidemic is so large, uh, the, the scale is so uh, enormous that the consequences are as if it was a sudden onset emergency, like an earthquake or a tsunami. Uh, I worked in a number of emergencies, earthquakes and civil wars, and what we see in, uh, in these three countries uh, is that the total breakdown of the whole society. The schools are closed, and the rest of the health system uh, is not working. Uh, people are um, fleeing their houses. Uh, it's a scarcity of food, civil unrest. You have a whole full scale of a complex emergency. So I just wanted to set that tone first. So we're talking about urban Ebola, which is a new thing. Uh, MSF, we've been responding to Ebola uh, for decades. Uh, we're supposed to be the experts. We're the ones to call when there's an Ebola outbreak. And it was like this this time as well. But nobody predicted, we didn't either, that it would uh, hit a 1.3 billion million uh, city like Monrovia. And that was what changed the game completely. It was already really bad, but when it hit uh, Monrovia, we knew that this was going to get into a, a very large scale uh, humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, it, it's not really clear, but this is the, um, the map of Monrovia, and the red dots are where uh, back in the uh, end of July uh, we had reported cases. And the larger the, the red dot, the more the cases. Uh, we knew already then that the number of cases was highly underreported. Uh, but what this map showed us was it that it was all over the city. It's in every, every street in Monrovia today. Uh, people are um, infected and people are dying. Uh, <clears throat> I arrived in uh, the begin, uh, end of Ju June. Um, and I stayed for two months. And when I came back, I was uh, really, really tired. Uh, and uh, I've been to crisis before, but this was a mental challenge that I hadn't seen. And for, for days, uh, maybe even now today, I can have yellow dreams. Uh, why are they yellow? Because <clears throat> I wore these boots a lot, and the people I worked with were wearing yellow boots. Uh, to protect, uh, so they can be cleaned and we don't take the virus with us when we leave uh, the center. I was around these people a lot. I didn't wear it myself more than twice in two, two months. I think that has not been focused enough. You don't need to dress up like an astronaut to fight Ebola. I am an emergency coordinator, I'm not even medical. What I'm doing is I am li liaising with the government, with other organizations, <coughs> I'm trying to take care of my team, I'm looking after the budget and the whole project management, so I'm not in direct contact with the virus on a daily basis. So, but I was around these people anyway. But I think what, what's mostly painting my dreams are these cars. Because the patients uh, in our center in Morovia, they didn't come in ambulances be simply because there are no ambulances. So they take a taxi. Uh, and they came at that point when I was there at a the very late stage. So they would come already dead on the way. They would be dead in the, in the car or they would die right after they arrived. And then we, of course, had to disinfect all these cars. Otherwise, the next... Uh, passenger would get infected. I felt very alone. And MSF, we've been feeling really alone since March. 
In June, this is from the garden on June 23rd, three days before I left for Monrovia, we went out and declared that this is out of control. June is a few months ago, and back then we were criticized, actually, for going out too strongly, to, being, to be alarmist, to create panic. I arrived in Monrovia three days later, hoping to find that at least maybe in Monrovia it was under control. Uh, I went alone, uh, hoping that I could go somewhere else to, because it was under control. It wasn't. Two days after I arrived, I pulled the alarm to my headquarters saying that you have to send me more people. This is not under control in Monrovia. Uh, however, I didn't have a big team at that time, so uh, I spent most of my time in this building. And the burden on these people's shoulders is, uh, can, can be shown in this picture. This is the building, and it's a heavy building. And what they were trying to fight almost alone in the Ministry of Health, uh, when they needed help, it's, it's just not possible. It was only MSF at that time and the local Red Cross who, who fight, fought the disease. We also thought this. They actually have a cure in, in Monrovia. <laughs> At least that's what was the newspaper was saying. Uh, and people were selling uh, herbs or nuts or things in the, in the market saying that it was a cure, uh, which is one of the many reasons why people didn't uh, believe it, that it was a uh, fatal disease, unfortunately. Uh, I... Uh, slowly started to get more people in from MSF, and we started to build uh, a management center for Ebola patients. Uh, we worked day and night to get it up because time was pressing. Um, and finally, we got up these tents. Um, they could take 20 patients each, and when we opened up, it was a 20-bed uh, facility. It had chlorinated water already ready in tap stands. We were quite proud of that. Uh, we felt kind of optimistic. Uh, this is how it looks like when we've disinfected uh, the equipment that can be reused. Um, but at the same time that we were fighting this, we were fighting also our own fears, especially these few days in this week. You can imagine I've been asked the questions hundreds of times, uh, are you not afraid? Are you willing to go back? And yes, I'm willing to go back. And I wouldn't say I'm, I'm afraid, but I do have a fear which is why I comply with all our um, rules and guidelines uh, that we have. One of them being that we cannot touch each other, ever. I didn't handshake or uh, kiss anyone on the cheek or anything throughout my two months. And I chose this picture because it shows the only moment when uh, our teams can touch each other. It's when we help, uh, help each other putting on the equipment uh, gear. And then we wash our hands excessively in uh, chlorinated water. And do, by doing that, we reduce the risks to a very, very large extent. So no, I'm not really afraid. I was more afraid when I worked in the civil war in Central African Republic. The ones who are afraid, no, sorry. I have another picture as well. It's my colleague Anna, who is actually, I can see, present. So uh, to show you that you don't have to dress up in a, a full protective equipment to, to fight this disease. Uh, we recruited a lot of people to go out in the street of Monrovia to talk to people face to face and to explain them wh wh what is this about and how can you protect yourself. That is a low risk um, activity as long as you apply the no touch rule. Those who are afraid though are all the people who are living there. You can go nowhere. This is a mother with two children. They are really afraid because they know that the disease is everywhere and they know that there is no help. This is what it looks like outside of our gate. And we don't have room for everyone. No experts. We were supposed to be the experts. Well, we're not anymore. After we'd opened up our 120-bed facility, we knew that this would not be enough at all. And we immediately started to expand it into how many, we didn't even know. We had meetings. In this particular meeting, I remember we decided why not we could build it into a 700-bed facility. Um, sounded like a good plan that night. The next morning, everybody woke up and we said, no, we're not going to do that. That's too dangerous. Uh, we are changing our plans literally every day. 
uh, we have to adapt because we don't know how to do this. We have had to let go of our guidelines and they have to come up with new, new ways to do it. One of them being to set up really large tents, tents who are meant, which are meant for storing goods. And I'm sorry to say, but today they are storing patients. Uh, to make it even worse, it was raining, literally every day when I was there. Um, but we kept building, and this is what it looks like when I, when I left, and I know today that it's, it's double, if not triple, this size. Uh, and I think the capacity today is at 250 bed. I know that that doesn't maybe say a lot, but that it's extremely complicated. We have around uh, 50 international staff and more than 500 national staff to do this. Uh, and it's a um, very high turnover of the patients. We have 20 patients dying every day. The, the good moments and the good news was really, really scarce. Uh, I think this is one of the only ones. It is the CDC laboratory that was set up uh, right next to our facility, so in walking distance, so we can go walk over with the test and get the lab results within hours. That was a huge improvement. Really a good collaboration with these guys. Um, of all the challenges, I think this one uh, is the biggest one. Uh, we were talking about DMB, DBM in uh, all meetings. Um, and what is DBM? It's dead body management. Nobody signs up to live with Doctors Without Borders to, to manage dead bodies. However, that is what our teams are doing to a great extent. The Liberian president decided to, to, that all um, Ebola patients should be cremated because it was so hard to get rid of in a safe, safe way or to bury, sorry for the term, um, the bodies. So we went into crematories, and our teams are training other teams in how to deal with dead bodies because, as you probably know, uh, this is when um, the, uh, a person is the most contagious, is right after, and after, the, after the death. So um, we are ha we've been had to do um, a lot of things that we're not used to do. Uh, we've been thinking about maybe we should make our own crematory. Uh, and everybody has to think outside of the box. And everybody has to step up. And that's also why we're asking even for military to, to come in. MSF, Doctors Without Borders, we never do that. We ask states, the Norwegian government, to, to come and do it. And they're kind of like confused, but what do you want us to do? And we, <laughs> we play the ball back and say, we don't really know, but you have to do something because this is going to get so huge if you don't do anything. So. Is there any hope then? Is it hopeless? I admit when I came back, I was really dark and very pessimistic, and I did not see how this could ever stop. I'm kind of still in that phase. At the same time, how can I lose hope when this is what happened when we opened, finally opened up our Ebola center, um, when the local community came with all these balloons and put them on our fence, and they sung uh, songs to thank us. To go there and help is providing hope for these people. But what is really going to save them, and I strongly believe this, yes, you have to send in people, but we really, really need treatment and we need vaccines. That is the hope of these people, and that's why we need to speed up that process uh, really fast and uh, with all the other factors that you mentioned here. And we are going to, to, to continue our pressure on our side and try to help out in any way we can to make that happen fast and uh, in the best manner possible. Thank you.